I told a few folks I was only going to speak for about 15 minutes this morning, and basically they looked at me and called me a liar. It might wind up being a little bit more than that, but I've got something I want to share with you this morning, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you guide now in this time. We thank you for what you're doing. Lord, do a great work here, we pray. Teach us. In Christ's name, amen. I, uh, I got a phone call this last Thursday night. You know, it's, you ever, you ever had a situation where, um, you know, you say, I wish you could be there. You know, man, I, I, I wish you were here. Boy, it, what an experience. That's what I've been through. And there are some things I, I wish I could say, you know, I, I wish you could have just been with me for a few days of this. Um, I love the ministry. I really do. I love the ministry. But I praise God for some things that I have in my background. One of those things is this. A shovel. Or like some of the guys that I worked with would say, a shovel. Really, you know, there, there are just some things like, you know, where's Bruce? Bruce, you here? Oh, gone? Okay. Uh, you know, some guys, uh, Ed would feel the same, you know, a hammer in the hand. And of course, we had that, we had that as well. I got a phone call Thursday night. Um, there's a gentleman that was my boss when I was in concrete. Um, he's been here a few times, he and his wife. Charlene, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, he took a he took a spill, a bad spill on a bike. In fact, the doctor said if you hadn't had a, a helmet on, you'd be dead. I mean, just that's just it. And uh, his mind got scrambled, and it was hard for him to speak. There were words that were kind of tough to come. <clears throat> and the um, the doctor said, yeah, I, I can understand that. It's going to take some time for it to come back. But it didn't come back. In fact, it wound up getting a little bit worse. In January, uh, they took him to uh, the doctor, and the doctor diagnosed him with dementia. Uh, in fact, it was a type of dementia. I don't remember the name of it. But mentally, it affects you like dementia. But physically, it's like Parkinson's. They said it was really rough. Well, his wife had gone to a class on this, and she came home on Thursday, and uh, Anton met her at the door and said, hey, so-and-so is on the phone. And so uh, she went to the phone and was talking to this person and wound up talking to them out in the garage and came back in and came in through the laundry room that they have in their house, and off to the right is his den, and then right there is the kitchen. And Anton was laying on the floor. And she thought he was kidding around, said, get up. And he didn't get up. They called 911. For a little while, they were able to get a, get a, a, a slight heartbeat. But he was declared dead, 70 years of age, on the way to the hospital in the ambulance. I got a phone call while I was at my son's house that evening from his daughter, Michelle, that had been in my youth group and was in my classes. Uh, when I was teaching in Christian school. It was absolutely stunning. I don't know how else to put this. You know, there, there, are some, there are some things that you go through and you wind up having a tool that goes along with it. But there are some things that you go through that just really wind up teaching you an incredible amount. It's humbling. And we're going to look at a little bit of that just, just for a few moments. But you look back and you rejoice at what God did. You rejoice at what the Lord showed you. I'll never forget, you know, being on the, uh, on the job. You know, concrete is, it was, it was hard. It was hard work. I, and, and by the way, it sticks with you. I still walk around in this auditorium and there's a couple of spots that bother me absolutely, drive me crazy. 
because I don't know who it was that was rotting the concrete at the time, but there's a hump back there, and, the, and, and, and it's like, where, you know, who, who set the stakes in this thing? Come on, folks. Brother Edgar uh, drives a concrete truck, and you know what I'm talking about. It's just something you get everything set up. And, uh, you know, you got your rod out, you got your tools, the bull float, Fresno, your, uh, your deep joiners, your six inch tool, whatever it is you're going to be using. And I, because I was the laborer and also the, uh, the operator on the, on the, uh, tractor, I was also the broom man. And the, and the, and the thing was a broom man, Makes a, makes a finisher look good. If you ever, if you ever look at a sidewalk and you see all the lines, you know, in the finish, that's a broom man. That was me. Broom man makes a guy look good. But the concrete truck had come up. Now you've got hundreds, if not thousands of dollars that you're going to be putting on the ground that day. I don't know, it was just, it was just something when you back up and you get the, and you get the, uh, you get the chutes out, and Anton would get on the chute. And all of a sudden, you'd crank it up, right? And that smoke would just come out from that, uh, from that diesel. And you just, you, you, you give the, you, you give the signal, and he'd go, bye guys. <laughs> and that's concrete start coming out, and I mean, we're moving it like crazy, you know, and, and you're rodding, and you, and you, all this, and you just fill in and holes, you're just going like crazy. But the fact of the matter is, as soon as that stuff hits the ground, the time is going. The clock has started. Because there are times when you get busy doing this and that, and all of a sudden the concrete does what you call it blew, it is blowing up. It's blowing up. What that means is you can't do anything with it much anymore. And all of a sudden you hear a guy say, sometimes go, uh-oh. <laughs> It's like, whoa, you know, and, and, and it's Katie bar the door. I remember we had a guy, uh, Rudy Salinas that worked with us, Rudy and Reuben, two brothers. His thing was when, when, when we'd get going and we're rodding and stuff, he'd go, push me, Tony, push me. In other words, yeah, get it going. You know, we, we got work to do. We got to get this stuff on the ground. And it was just, folks, I wish you could have been there. It was just great. It was an incredible experience. Everybody on the crew was a professing Christian. We witnessed to guys on backhoe and tractor and truck drivers, and some of the truck drivers got saved, and other guys, and I mean, just, you know, there were people that came out. We were known in the East Bay is all those, those guys always talking about God. We got made fun of. Folks, that's my background. Okay? That's, that's my background. I went from that to this. And I praise God for it. One time, this just doesn't happen on a job, okay? It just doesn't happen on a job. One time, we're, the, 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 the concrete truck broke down. They, sometimes they do, don't they, brother? And we're waiting, and we decided we're going to quote Scripture. My boss knew the Bible like few pastors that I know, and that is no joke. That is no joke. We had an evangelist came to our church one time, and he taught a Sunday school class. My boss taught a Sunday school class, and the evangelist came up and said, I have just sat through the greatest Sunday school class I have ever sat through. That was it. That, I mean, that was the background. And we quoted scripture from every book in the Bible. Every book. I mean, I, and I've told you this story before as well. The guy that owned our company was worth a hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars. He had property in Texas, in California, and in Hawaii. He had two sons, one just a little bit older than I was, one a little bit younger. They'd come on the, they'd come on the job site and they would make fun of us. I mean, we were building custom homes and, and we did for them. I mean, I, I'm talking homes in 1980 that were worth a half million dollars. 
But one day his younger son came on the job and said, what was that verse that you were talking about? Share it with him, you know, and stuff. And he'd come back, you know, and he'd talk, you know, different stuff. And one day he come on, he came on the job and he said, Anton, I got saved. I got saved. Now, brother, you, you talk about people getting changed by the gospel. He had just bought a brand new, right out of the box Corvette. Brand new. Ordered it, not from the showroom, straight from Chevy, exactly as he wanted it. He kept it for six weeks. He took that back, he, he, he took that Corvette to the Jaguar dealership and traded it in on a Jag, top of the line. Kept it for six weeks. Took the Jag back to the dealership, got his money back, grabbed his pickup, came out to the job site, and said, you know something, it just doesn't mean anything anymore. And turned around and gave the money for that car to Anton so his daughter could go to Bible college full four years. I remember when Ralph Romero, we called him our Mexican hairless, when he got saved. He trusted Christ as Savior, grabbed, went, got, got in his pocket, pulled out, a, a, a handful of pot threw it on the ground. It was just, it was just stuff like that, folks. All at the end of a shovel. All pouring concrete. Now the seven of us, three are with the Lord, and it just, it, it, it's just stunning to me. And I got to thinking about it. You know, what are some, what, what are some lessons that? You know, I've learned that I've picked out. Honestly, it's just, you know, here I was, I was, I was seeing my, gra- my grandson, Logan, Logan Michael Rogers, and he's a beautiful baby. We had a great time. All the kids were sick. Oh, my soul. They were all sick. And, and, and then my wife got sick. And I'm thinking, Lord, keep me healthy. I got this surgery coming up on Tuesday. I can't be sick. I don't want to, you know, I, 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 I can't postpone this. Lord, we've got to get this done. But I got to thinking about, I got to thinking about this. Okay, you're in Matthew 18. I want you to go to verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This, this is what the Jews were into. There was, you know, there, 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 there were positions that you could take. You know, be it, uh, not, not only just, you know, physically speaking, there where you had different levels of religious rulers, but also, you know, you looked at Rome and there were governors and of course there was Caesar and so forth and they're thinking a physical kingdom. Okay, Lord, you are going to establish a kingdom. Now, two brothers have already come and said, hey, can we be on your right side and your left side? And the Lord said, that's not the way this is. But in Matthew 18, they come to him and they say, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Okay, if it's not, Lord, you to, for you to give, to, to sit on the right hand or the left hand, Lord, who is the greatest? And Jesus called a little child unto him. Now stop and think about this. If you can grasp the view, a little child, off somehow, somewhere, there, there was a child that was there and people were listening and, and, and folks were just gathered around and we don't know what all it was, but he grabbed somebody like, like my little grandson, Jack. Or, you know, somebody, you, you, you've got grandkids, we, we've got little kids around here. And he sits down and he puts the child on his lap And he says, verily I say unto you, truly, I I want you to listen to this. Except he be converted, there's a change that needs to be made. Except he be converted and become as little children, ye cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But then he goes on further in verse 4 and he says this, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. Now let's, let's back the truck up right there. 
Have you ever seen a child, little child that's humble? <laughs> little children don't come up and, hi, sir. That, that's not what he's talking about here. Watch. Whoever, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, we need to remember this, and, and we're not remembering it like we could. Little children do not act humble. It's the position that they are in. Little children are absolutely dependent, whether they know it or not. They are absolutely 100% dependent on their parents, on adults. A three-year-old, a two-year-old does not go to the barbecue and whip up tri-tip and mashed potatoes and a salad. It doesn't happen. And when a little child gets hurt, the child does not self-diagnose and go to the doctor and get a couple of opinions. When the little child gets hurt, what is the one word that comes out other than ouch? Mommy! Now we saw a lot of that when we were with my son. And if they're really desperate, they say, Nana! <laughs> Just, no. They never say Papa. It's kind of interesting. I'm taking that personally, actually, a little bit. Yeah, oh well. But the point is, is they are absolutely dependent. Now, you know what? Doing the concrete work, we knew that we had time, but not a lot of time to get stuff done. Because there was time when this shovel was not going to move that concrete around. It's done. It ain't going anywhere. It was great. It's been great to be able to go different places and show my family and actually go back and, 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 and see some places where we've done concrete work. It's still there. It's enduring. It's great. It ain't going anywhere unless somebody jackhammers it out. The point I'm trying to make is this. We've got just a little bit of time. And there are some changes that need to be made while our hearts are still pliable by God's grace and while we have the time. I want to remember something, and I want us all to remember something. My, my heart is going to be in this place. I'm going in for the surgery, Lord willing, unless it gets postponed. I'm going in for Tuesday, Tuesday morning for the knee replacement. My goal is to be back in three weeks. I do not like being gone. I, I, I don't. Not that I don't trust anybody. It's, it's not that my heart is here. This is, this is where my passion is. And I'll guarantee you, I'm going to be praying for this place. I do anyway. My heart is here. And, and this is part of it. Because one day we're going to be standing before Him. I want us to know some things now. While, while, while the, the, the concrete, as it were, is still workable. Before somebody goes, uh-oh. I want to remember that I need my Lord like my grandkids need their parents. I want to remember also that my Lord responds in a love I cannot begin to fathom. But I need Him. Now, you know, we're all supposed to mature in Christ. And, and praise God, the Bible tells us to. But here's the challenge. Here's the problem. Instead of sometimes growing mature in Christ, we grow distant. One of the things that I've really enjoyed in, this, in these last two or three weeks, in uh, a book I've been reading and some passages I've been going through, and just in meditation, calling my God 
Abba, Father. The Aramaic for a close, intimate relationship, Daddy. He's my Father. I want you to go, if you would please, in Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Do you know there's no such thing as a strong Christian? Now wait a minute. Yes, there is. No, there isn't. There's no such thing as a strong Christian. There are only Christians that are strong in Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. You know what that's talking about? Be humble. Be humble. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Not of your plans, not of your schemes, nothing like that. But take what God has. That takes humility of a child. That means that we recognize we are absolutely 100% dependent on Him. You see, what, what, what would please me like nothing else is to know that our local church, when, when, when we walk out of here today, that we're going out and we're determined that day by day, our attitude is going to be this, Lord, I need thee, moment by moment, I need thee every hour as we sing. I mean, we need you. God, there is not a moment that I don't. Philippians 4.13, we know the passage. I can do all three things. No, I can do all things through Christ. Are you hearing this this morning? Do we have ears to hear? Why is it that it's so, so often it takes so much to penetrate our minds on this? Maybe we've solidified a little bit more than we'd like to think. I can't do it without you, God. I absolutely can't do it without you. Now listen, the Lord taught us, the, the Lord taught us a model on how to resist Satan. He gave it to us in Matthew 4. Remember? It is written, and that's how he countered what Satan was trying to tempt him with. And tempt, Satan came at him with his, his modus operandi, his, his typical MO, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Christ came back and said, no, it is written, the word of God, not for us, not our thinking. And even Christ could have banished him just like that. He showed us something. He showed us something. He also modeled how we should approach the Father. Mark 14. Write this down, would you? Mark 14. Listen to this. He is in the midst of his agony, preparing to go to the cross. And he says in Mark 14, 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Now notice the deepness of the relationship here. This, this is Christ preparing to go to the cross, and he says, Abba, Father. Now look at how we are told to approach the Father ourselves. Romans 8.15 For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry. Abba, Father. You see, we might boast in how we've matured in Christ, but the fact of the matter is, we might have grown up, but we've grown distant. This is a maturity that we don't recognize too often. Galatians 4, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son, the same Son that prayed that in the garden. God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, 
crying, Abba, Father. How close is God? How close is your Father? Is He in some distant area? My God is not. He's with me. He's here. How do I know? He said so. His Son told me so. Spirit, Son, Father, with us. The same intimate relationship the Lord spoke of when He went to the cross is for us. And and, and before we become hardened, before we set up, before we stand before Him, while our hearts can change, and I pray you've got a heart that is pliable in the hands of the Father, there's a maturity that we need to have. There's a man by the name of Charles Hodge, 19th century Princeton theologian. He gave us an example of continuous prayer. Listen to this. He says, In my childhood I came nearer to pray without ceasing than in any other period of my life. Remember? A child. As far back as I can remember, I had the habit of thanking God for everything I received and asking Him for everything I wanted. If I lost a book or any of my playthings, I prayed that I might find it. I prayed walking through the streets, in school and out of school, whether playing or studying. I did not do this in obedience to any prescribed rule. It seemed natural. I thought of God as an everywhere present being, full of kindness and love who would not be offended if children talked to him. I knew he cared for sparrows. I was as cheerful and happy as the birds and acted as as they did. Why? He had this relationship. And I got to thinking, suddenly praying without ceasing makes complete sense. Now you watch a child interact with the parents in, 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 in in a house. There's no forcing of the relationship. They're just there. They're not, a, a two-year-old is not constantly asking mommy and daddy, do you really love me? It's, it's a given. It's a given. The relationship is not doubted. The relationship is not strained. With a loving parent, it's just there. It's exercised. It's normal. What is it that Jesus said? Become as a little child? This is who the greatest person is. The the greatest person is the one who has the incredible, intimate relationship that any Christian can have because the fact of the matter is the potential is there. All we have to do is access it. That's it. Do you know what the opposite of a childlike spirit is? Oh, wait a minute. I I know your mind might be thinking of some things. But you know what the opposite is? Cynical. A cynic. You ever hear somebody that's always cynical about stuff? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, uh uh-huh. That's the same way that we wind up treating God. God isn't really going to hear my prayer. We don't come out and say this, but this is how we subtly act. God isn't really walking with me. God doesn't really know my burden. And you know, the fact of the matter is, God God really doesn't care for how I hurt. Now, we might not come out and say that, but that's how we act. God's not going to give me power to obey His will. God surely doesn't ask this of me because he knows me the way I am, we wind up being cynical. And if God does answer a prayer, and he does answer prayer, the flesh just comes back 
with that cynical attitude and says, I would have happened anyway. You know, our problem is, is we've kind of talked ourselves into just not bothering the Lord. Remember what maybe some of us have been taught, maybe you've been taught this, that if it takes this much to get something done, we have this much uh, talent, power, achievement, plan. You know, we, we have this much power. And so we were taught, well, God makes up the rest. And so what we wind up subtly doing is, is we seek to build this up. The fact of the matter is, if we need this much power, this much wisdom to get the Lord's work done in our lives, we don't need this much of ourselves. We need that done away with. We need to go 100% God. We need to be a, we need to be a family of God that are children. Absolutely, absolutely, 100% like little ones. We can do nothing without Him because the Bible says we can do nothing without Him. Nothing. I'm going to be praying for you. I know some of you are going to be here tonight. I wish all of you were. This video series has been great. But I wonder if, quite honestly, in your Christian walk, you've been cynical. Ah, the Lord really wouldn't. I, I, I've got to be the way I am because, you know, I just can't really trust the Lord to, to give His best. I know what's best for me. No, you don't. No, you don't. And we're not going to learn that the best, His best, really is the best. Until we turn from being that, that cynic and being that little child that absolutely lives in abandon with their Heavenly Father. I love what God has done in my life. I praise God for the people He put in my life and the things that I learned and looking back, and especially since I got that phone call Thursday night, I, I rejoice and just, just meditating on that. I also look at where I've struggled and I realize that, you know, <laughs> there were too many times that I was seeking to do it on my own. There, there are situations in this church right now that I don't need my wisdom. I must have God's wisdom. But even in the day by day, not just the church, but, but myself, as, as a child of God, and it's the same with you, would you please go out of here today with that intimate relationship with a Father that loves you more than you can ever know? And let that Spirit of Christ speak through you. Abba, Father, Daddy, intimate relationship. Thank you, God. Let's stand for prayer.